Is social media a danger to children? The U.S. Surgeon General has issued a serious warning pressing for action to protect young people online. Several U.S. states have already passed child social media laws, but is it the best way to protect their mental health, or is the government going too far? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is social media safety. In a digital age dominated by social media platforms, teenagers have become active participants, sharing their experiences, thoughts, and emotions. But the U.S. Surgeon General is sounding the alarm over the negative effects it has on children. In a recent advisory, Vivek Murthy said that while social media offers some benefits, it may cause and perpetuate body image issues, affect eating behavior and sleep quality, plus lead to low self-esteem, especially among adolescent girls. The report then outlines ways policymakers should strengthen safety standards. Here's a look. Social media is entertaining, educational, and empowering, and teenagers can't get enough, spending hours at a time scrolling through social feeds and posting pictures online. But how safe is it? In an advisory reminiscent of the warnings issued about smoking in the 80s, the U.S. Surgeon General is now warning that social media can harm young people. And prolonged usage can contribute to a range of mental health issues, including anxiety, depression, loneliness, and poor self-esteem. What well, we're living through a youth mental health crisis in our country that I've said is the defining public health issue of our time. And I'm increasingly concerned that social media use is an important driver of this youth mental health crisis. Up to 95% of 13 to 17 year olds in the US are on social media. More than a third say they use it constantly. And on average, teens spend 3.5 hours each day on these platforms. Something research says can double the risk of depression and anxiety. Even though all major social media platforms require users to be at least 13 to open an account, Nearly 40% of kids 8 to 12 surveyed say they've used social media too. And the advisory is urging parents, tech companies, and policymakers to take action immediately. I call for specific action from technology companies, from policymakers, because we need safety standards for social media the way we have for cars, for car seats, for toys, for uh, medications, and for other products that kids use so that parents have more assurance. Uh, that these products are safe for their kids. And also calls for safeguards from tech companies for children who are at critical stages of brain development. When asked about the impact of social media on their body image, nearly half of 13 to 17 year olds say social media makes them feel worse about their bodies. And two thirds say they're often or sometimes exposed to hate-based content. As teen suicide rates rise in the U.S., more states, including Utah and Arkansas, are passing child social media laws to address fears that online platforms are harming the well-being of children. And governments around the world are racing to introduce legislation and pass bills like the U.K.'s Online Safety Bill and the EU's Digital Services Act. But teenagers say it's not all bad in the digital world. They say social media makes them feel more connected and provides a place to show their creative side, find support through tough times, and find acceptance. But as we navigate the ever-evolving realm of social media, the Surgeon General's warning is a call to action to protect the mental health of teens, compelling social media platforms to protect children from the harmful content online. Well, joining me now to debate how best to protect children on social media, or if it's really necessary, are from Boston, Josh Golan. He is the executive director of Fair Play. Yael Osowski joins us from Vienna. He is the deputy director at the Consumer Choice Center. And from Chapel Hill is Mitch Prinstein. He is the chief science officer at the American Psychological Association. Thanks all so much for being with us. Josh, I will start with you. Tell us why you think social media actually needs more controls in order to protect children. And remember that right now, as far as I understand, most social media firms in the U.S. do prevent children under 13 from registering. Is that not enough? 
Uh, well, first of all, um, they don't prevent children from under 13 of re uh, from registering. There are millions of kids in the U.S. on platforms like TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat, um, and the companies have turned a blind eye to the fact that these young users who shouldn't be there and it's not safe for them to be there are there. So that's the first thing we need to do is we need to get those under 13s. But even that's not enough. Um, teens are incredibly vulnerable to persuasion and manipulation, and they um, are are you know, their, their brains are still developing and they're, they're um, prone to risk taking and other things that I'm sure Dr. Princeton will, will talk about. Um, so we need protections for kids online. Um, you know, we are in the midst of a mental health crisis um, where where kids are, are being exposed to th uh, things on social media that is exacerbating anxiety and depression. They're being shown uh, content that exacerbates their eating disorders or encourages eating disorders and self-harm. Um, it's a completely unregulated space. And as a result, children are being harmed every single day. Um, and so we need some protections and guide rails uh, to make social media safer for young people. Okay, Mitch, I will turn to you then. I, I mean, I suppose you agree there. And then just tell me what you really think is necessary and realistic to be done. Well, right now, you know, we're unaware of a single line of code in these programs that change the experience of social media for an eight-year-old compared to an 80-year-old. And the fact is, these platforms need to be sensitive to the developmental changes of kids, in particular, their brains. You know, keep in mind that after the first year of life, this is the second most important time for brain development. So the vulnerabilities that kids have of being really socially sensitive, but not yet a fully developed prefrontal cortex, which means really hard time with self-control, that might be getting exploited here by media companies that are using artificial intelligence to keep kids engaged much longer than they should, which is especially concerning if it's interfering with their sleep time. That is actually changing the size of kids' brains and also how kids' brains grow and develop. You know what, Mitch, I'll stick with you because I'm actually having trouble distinguishing what is different about what we're talking about today in social media versus when TV, you know, was seen as the problem. When you, I, I know uh, we, uh, we watch countless hours. I mean, I especially watch countless hours of TV, and there were so many complaints that, you know, this was taking time away from actual socialization. Uh, there were shocking reports about kids who were, you know, getting sucked into video games and everything else, and it never really materialized to be so bad. And, and as a child myself that spent literally way above the national average, which was shocking at the time, watching television, uh, I feel we got away with it just fine. Yeah, and you know, there's something a little bit different for this compared to TV. Two things in particular. One is the extent to which every interaction is quantified. So, you know, there's a part of the brain that's very sensitive to getting social signals or feedback. And now we can actually put numerical votes on how much people like you, like what you said, you know, um, that that is really concerning. But the second and perhaps most concerning piece of this is the artificial intelligence. Because keep in mind that our brains were built to really handle the environment that we live in. And in only about 20 years, we now have outsourced most of our social decisions to a computer. It tells us who to be friends with, in what order to see their posts. When we see things that have a lot of likes attached to them, it actually changes which regions of the brain are responding to that information. And it makes us more likely to like those posts and to engage in very similar behaviors. And that's very different than the TV, which we could easily just shut off or passively consume. Mm. Yael, is that true? Is social media much more of a threat than, than television could have ever been? I would argue no, and I think there are many benefits of social media that have been around now that we've been able to research it and understand it. And we also have to understand that this is, as you kind of mentioned, Andrea, it's the latest iteration of technology. It is the way that we're meeting friends in which we're really trying to post our lives. And we're actually able to gain new functions. We're able to learn new things. And I think the, the fears that I have is that if we have more of these uh, sort of draconian bills, we're going to gatekeep an entire generation from using not just the internet, but the future of digital technology. When I was a younger person, 12 to 14, 15 years old, I was able to learn about the internet, about HTML, doing websites. If we look at a lot of the privacy bills that have been introduced in states like Arkansas or things that are being discussed in Washington, D.C., 
who would effectively have a generation that wouldn't be allowed to do the same things that I was. I do think, however, I will agree with my fellow panelists, there is a duty and there's an important duty for parents. I'm a father myself. I think it is something very important. It is something that the American Psychological Association and Mitch, they've been able to point out, parents do have a special duty to ensure that kids are safe online, that they're on the right platforms, that they're checking that. Uh, again, we want to be sure that they're able to use the great technologies of the future. We're talking about AI each and every day. If kids are not able to get online to learn, if they're not able to interact with technology, with social media profiles, how are they supposed to be prepared for the next generation and what technology will bring? Interesting point. And as you mentioned, Mitch, or Yael, sorry, the uh, the latest iteration, post-TV, you know, you will have to remember when Congress, you know, and Tipper Gore actually thought that they had to protect us from satanic death metal, gangster rap. You know, music was a serious threat. There needed to be warning labels on albums that we hear music, that music today, and we laugh because it was actually kind of funny. But wow, was that a movement. Do you think there are similarities today with how people see social media? Absolutely, there's a moral panic around every single corner and it happens every single generation and we're sort of in the throes of it right now. I think uh, one thing I'm most fearful of though is that we have this moral panic, uh, we have a lot of tools, legislators are uh, very active on this and hopefully they will try to pass some bills. And I think we, we might actually go to a part where not only our privacy, but our security uh, will also be at threat here. Because a lot of the bills that mention many of the uh, protecting online kids, we have this in Arkansas, you know, they mention sending your biometrics, sending pictures to these platforms. Uh, so we're really talking about taking away the idea of the anonymous internet where you can be safe and secure online, where we're safeguarding privacy. I think a lot of that is putting way too much onus on private platforms. And it's something that the government should really not have its hand in. We need parental responsibility. We also need great competition. And yeah, we do need great innovation to figure out what those platforms will be, what will the technologies be in the future. I think that's a better way to do it. If we want to talk about legislative action, let's talk about a national online privacy bill. We don't have one in the United States. They have them in other countries or other blocks of the world. That might be a better route to take than trying to gatekeep our kids from getting online. Mitch, I can see you agree with, with a lot of what you heard there. But Josh, let me come to you because I want to pick up on the potential benefits for kids, especially those who suffer mm -hmm. from, you know, crippling shyness, social awkwardness. Did they find communities online that are life-changing for them? So there's a serious contingent, and I'm not sure how much real research has been done into it to try and give numbers on this. It's difficult. Uh, but it is really important. It's life-changing for certain kids that need that outlet because they're not good at functioning person in person anyway. Um, well, I certainly think, um, you know, we're not talking uh, about keeping kids off of the Internet entirely. We're talking about putting in safeguards uh, to make it a safer experience so that kids can connect and socialize and learn and explore without being manipulated into the plot by the platforms into seeing incredibly harmful content or to spend more time on the platform than they, they want to. These platforms actually undermine users' autonomy. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, if you go to on TikTok, um, they wait until you're about to log off to show you the video that they think is going to most likely keep you on that platform even going, even longer. That's undermining the, a child's autonomy who's trying to get off and the platform is pulling them back. We don't need that. We need, we need platforms that respect user autonomy, that help them get the offline time that they need to thrive. And, and the last thing I'll just say is, you know, this term moral panic is tossed around. It's a meaningless term. It means that I'm not concerned about what you're concerned about. It wasn't a moral panic when we wanted seatbelts and airbags and cars. Um, it was simple consumer safety legislation and protections, and that's what we need on social media. I could say that Yale is uh, morally panicked about the government regulating the Internet. Just using the phrase morally panicked doesn't mean that the concerns I'm not aren't sure. true. I mean, is it fair, though, to say, you know, regulating seatbelts in cars actually compares to the way we socialize in our personal lives? I think what the, the mistake that you're making is you're acting like what we do on social media is 100% in our control. The way that social media is designed 100% affects the experience that we have. If I go and register for TikTok or Instagram as a 14-year-old girl and then look up posts on healthy meat eating, within minutes, you will be barraged with content 
recommending how to have an eating disorder with your parents not discovering it. That okay. is not, a, you know, but the, John, what's... A couple things there, because sure. I, and I know you've spoken a lot about this business model that you want to see regulated, because you think it does uh, keep... Companies manage to keep kids online for, for much longer than you think they, they should have been or would have been. Uh, the problem is that's what advertisers have always done. You know, I brought up the TV comparison before. Oh my gosh, the amount that was thrown at us, you know, peddling terrible food, for example, that I felt like an outcast if I didn't have it in school the next day in my lunchbox. Um, what else? I mean, alcohol online, or alcohol on television ads that were during broadcast hours that children were watching, those must have toys that, again, you felt like an outcast if you didn't have it because that was being peddled on TV. I mean, none of that was necessarily great for children, but why is it so different now? Well, I mean, first of all, um, we shouldn't we shouldn't downplay the role of television advertising and what it's done to children. We have an epidemic of uh, childhood obesity worldwide, of which television food advertising is a huge contributing factor. Um, kids drink earlier when they see alcohol ads earlier. They smoke earlier when they see smoking ads. So, so um, I, I guess I would fundamentally disagree with this idea that advertising is not harmful to children. And in fact, that is the that is the crux of the problem. These platforms. Okay, but have I mean been that's designed. that's a huge that has never been regulated in the United States. I mean, come on, commercials are actually part of our entertainment culture. We still sing them today. I mean, commercials we know from decades ago. That hasn't changed at all. And the messaging in it is arguably pretty bad for kids, but you know that's not going to go away. Uh, well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little sorry. different than you. When I see kids being harmed by bad advertising, I don't just shrug and say, that's great. Um, that's the way things it's not have always great, been. But I, it think kind of, I, yeah. I, I work to try and change that. Okay, I'm sorry. Mitch, I, I, I've been waiting. Uh, you, you've been waiting to jump in. Go ahead. Oh, no, sure. I was just going to say, this is why at the American Psychological Association, we're recommending kind of a balanced approach where we can really appreciate that kids need to learn how to use social media appropriately because there are scientifically proven benefits to social media use. Any product that you buy for a kid has an insert that tells you how to use the product safely. Don't throw that electronic toy and don't play with it in the bathtub, right? So we just need for social media to build in if and if they need to be compelled to do so, some training to teach people how to use their products safely, particularly given that kids' brains are not fully developed. Just in the same way that we don't let kids start driving when they become of age, they first have to demonstrate competence through a driver's test so we can be sure that they know how to operate a car safely. Same thing here. We want them to learn social media literacy, to be aware of the risks of mis and disinformation, to understand that not all profiles are actual humans, and to recognize the ways that this might be taking advantage of some of their biological vulnerabilities. Then everyone can use social media in a way that's safe for them. Hmm. Okay, Yael, does that sound fair? I, I think there are any kind of arguments you can make for literacy online, and I think it is something very important, and there are a lot of institutions that provide that. It's something that we could integrate into the schooling system. Uh, but if we're talking about you know, trying to segment populations on social media more and more, uh, we're just kind of adding on more and more layers of complexity to a lot of the online platforms, which realistically what we're going to do in an economic and innovative sense is really just give a lot of hands up to the larger tech platforms, which is kind of what I fear the most. I'd like to have a great innovative startup world. A lot of the apps that kids are using today are apps that don't even, they're not even founded in the United States. They're apps like TikTok, they're apps like Be Real. Uh, there's a lot of these app, that apps that are kind of being promoted to children, being promoted to younger people uh, that are not based in the United States, likely will not follow these laws. And if we're not going to have great innovative setups, laws, policies in the United States, we could see a lot of innovation that's happening abroad, and they're not going to follow any of these American rules. I think that's what I fear the most. We need to make sure that we keep that innovation there, not just for kids online, we need to have that private education, but also make these platforms usable for the vast majority of adults who also have great use for all of these platforms, who use them professionally. They have businesses, they connect with their friends, with their colleagues. Uh, we have to think about that as well. We can't just segment and gatekeep all parts of the internet. I know there, there are great studies and things that are being uh, done in terms of what we can train, all kinds of seminars we can do. We should absolutely do them, 
uh, trying to integrate that or have some mandate from the U.S. federal government, I think, is just a step too far. Okay. Uh, Mitch, I have to come back to you for one second, because another thing, that, another issue that Josh raised that has been talked about, talked about by the U.S. Surgeon General as well, uh, is this potential to, you know, uh, perpetuate eating disorders, especially among adolescent girls, and I don't know, if you, if you remember in the, the 90s, for example, you know, models like Kate Moss, for example, those were, that was the standard. You know, this is a woman that said nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Uh, today, I would argue that the standard is much more diverse. In many cases, it's much more fuller-figured, healthier-looking women. Yet, social media seems to be being blamed for an increase in eating disorders. How does that square? I don't think we can blame social media as the exclusive or even predominant cause for eating disorders. We should know, though, that when kids, you know, there's been really interesting experiments that show when you show kids something very risky and you show them a photo of that in a social media-like platform, they have activation of their self-control center. It's called the prefrontal cortex. When you show them the same image with a lot of likes attached to it, the prefrontal cortex shuts down really compelling evidence to tell us that there's something about seeing that quantification, those likes attached to photos that are changing how the brain processes information. Even more, when kids see those photos with likes, that's directly related to them believing that the majority of their peers approve of those risk behaviors, which then predicts onset of their own engagement in the same behavior. So we're really seeing a link between social media exposure to content it's changing the brain. It's changing how kids themselves behave as a result. Okay. And that's just something we need to keep some guardrails around. Hmm. Fair enough. Uh, Josh, let me come back to you and, and ask if there's another consequence here. Uh, because social media is a reality for most kids. So is there the potential for parents keeping children away from social media actually leading to more bu bullying? I don't know if you ever experienced when you were young, there were always the kids in school whose parents again, didn't let them watch TV. So they didn't know, you know, the, they were ostracized in a way because they didn't have the references to the latest shows that they missed. And again, funny commercials, everything that kids talk about in pervasive American entertainment culture. Uh, could there be a risk of that as well? If kids, certain kids and parents that are active and, you know, monitoring what they do, take that social media away? Well, I think that's actually the crux of what the problem is. Um, as a parent, you face two terrible choices right now. You can let your child be on social media and um, experience all of the harms and manipulations and the privacy invasions uh, and the harmful content that is rampant on social media, or you can isolate your child from their peers. Um, there should be a third choice. Your, your child should be able to go on social media and you should be confident as a, as, a, as a parent that the social media has been designed with their interests in mind. So it's not going to be, um, you know, facilitating the contact of adult strangers to your child, or it's not going to be showing pro eating disorder content, or it's not going to be deliberately trying to make you feel bad if you log off or if you miss your friend posting something. Um, so so I'm, not a, I'm not in favor of keeping kids off social media. I'm in favor of making social media a, a safer and more a child-friendly experience so that kids can have, uh, can socialize with their peers without parents having to worry about really these most serious harms. We work with parents whose kids have died because of social media. That shouldn't be happening. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a false dichotomy. We want kids on, on social media and safer. Not The goal is not to keep them all off. Yeah, y'all go ahead. I, I would say with that, I mean, obviously there are, there are harms that exist on the internet, but again, these are extensions of things that happen in real life. You know, what, we mentioned cyber bullying. Well, that is bullying. Uh, we know this, this is a trope that is in our culture. It's something that everyone who went to high school understands, and there are different reasons that people might be picked on. Uh, just because things elevate to the digital realm doesn't mean all of a sudden some, some kind of platform is gonna be able to stop it. Uh, we just need to have much more parental supervision and responsibility. I think what we're doing is we're abdicating a lot of that responsibility when we say we just want some kind of national bill passed by Congress or the Senate uh, or even our state legislatures. And, and I think that's just creating a lot of bad incentives. We've become too dependent on these larger institutions to try to tell us how to parent our children, and we're not really making our own efforts. And, and there are great educational tools, again, that by both panelists here that provide great information, and I think people should use them, parents should use them, uh, but we should not try to 
uh, try to ratchet down all of our social media websites, because again, the vast majority of people who use these are adult consumers who are using them professionally, personally, or otherwise. Uh, if we're only going to try to make these for adults, uh, then we're again, we're just kind of separating kids and we're creating a Chinese wall so that they're not going to be able to learn. They're not going to be able to experiment. They're not going to be able to have the same tools and technologies that I had growing up. And we're in an online international battle now for AI, for innovation. I, I would rather that our American kids be prepared and ready for that than not prepared. Mitch, just quickly, I saw well, skeptical for a second. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, you're both right. And, and, and the science suggests that what we're seeing is cyberbullying online is, in fact, worse than, cyber bull than bullying that's happening offline. It's more severe, it's more permanent, and it has effects above and beyond what kids are experiencing offline. Moreover, just witnessing that cyberbullying, even if you're not the victim, is having psychological consequences, too. So that is, in fact, something that is not just a reflection of what's happening offline. But I also agree that this is a complex situation. No one stakeholder can fix it. We need the tech companies and the policymakers and the parents and the educators all to play a role. Social media is here to stay. Let's start teaching kids how to live in a world with it. Okay, Mitch, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank sincerely all three of my panelists so much for being with us on this edition of The Newsmakers. Great discussion, and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.